So I have been working on uh, the dedicant path for Anria Thane, the Druidic group that I am a solitary member of for years now. I've been working on the dedicant path for years, not because it is really complex or advanced in terms of the requirements, but because it's heavy. I think we know when we do magic that, and when we just live life, that what is simple is not always easy. And while the dedicant path might be simple, if you're actually doing it in any depth, it's not the easiest thing in the world. It uh, really forces you to take stock of your practice, of what you value, of what you prioritize, which is what we should be doing in life in general. And as I'm finally over five years later of starting it um coming to a close of uh, finishing the requirements which i'm very excited about i wanted i knew that i wanted to share some of it some of my writing of the for the requirements online but i wasn't sure which of them to share first and i don't like to be redundant that's a big reason i haven't posted more uh of just directly magic or directly pagan or druidic type videos is because there's a ton of great educators out there. There's a ton of books. And I just felt like I didn't want to add something that wasn't particularly useful when it's already been done. And that's also maybe just me being a little overly harsh on myself. Obviously, there's always more to say because we're still doing it. It's a living practice. It's a living faith. But I decided that I wanted to do this video on the nine virtues uh, of Arnriach's Fane, because it is so often that we talk about the, you know, the how, or the, you know, surface, not, not surface, but it's like all these different methods of, okay, tarot, crystals, uh, meditation, journaling, and we rarely, or not, just not as often do we discuss the why with any depth. Like, why bother reading tarot? Why bother charging crystals why bother doing anything and you know that isn't just and obviously like it's fun and I'm so concerned about a rattlesnake but <laughs> we'll be fine um to get back on my train of thought yes it is fun yes sometimes just because we're born witches because we're born to do it sometimes that is an answer and that's great and that's been my answer sometimes before but I love that Arnriach Thane has virtues to begin with. And this is not a video, this is not a video on historical druidry. I feel like we so often get caught in the weeds. Um, I'm physically in some weeds right now, huh? Uh, just talking about the past and how we're restricted by how little we know. But the fact is that there are robust practices that exist today. If you want to get into the history, I've spoken to some amazing practitioners uh, that double as historians like Ian Corrigan and Murtaugh on Doyle. Um, and you can look into that for yourself. Maybe I'll discuss it another time. Today, I am here to discuss the nine virtues, which are as follows. And I will be scrolling through them a bit. Wisdom, piety, vision, courage, integrity perseverance, hospitality, moderation, and fertility. So I am just straight up going to read what I've written for this. Uh, and I, like everything else I post, hope it just gives you some food for thought. Um, these are simply the virtues of ADF. We had to uh, or we're invited to, rather, you don't have to do anything. It's uh, doing the dedicant path is optional. Um, we are invited, if we want to do it, to write our understanding of these virtues, uh, to define them, and to sort of write our, our understanding of them with at least 300 words. So these are mine with an introduction that no one asked for, but I am giving anyways, because I care. <laughs> So before a TV show called The Magicians turned into one of the most laughably fake, like emotionally fake theater kid productions to ever waste its time on screen, the first two seasons were some of the best, most just emotionally uh, real feeling, accurate depictions of what doing magic in the present world is like that I have ever seen. 
So maybe, I'm not here to talk about the TV show, maybe it buckled under the weight of maintaining compelling stories in two different worlds, because spoiler alert, it does involve a fantasy realm. Maybe the writers were stifled because uh, of the meager source material, because the original books were young adult novels, and we kind of all know what that is. Uh, and maybe they just didn't actually understand magic well enough to continue writing compelling stories on it. But I don't know, and it doesn't really matter, because the first two seasons were magical and i am grateful for them because a i'm a nerd and b one line from uh, one of those first two magical seasons has always struck me and it's that magic doesn't come from talent magic comes from pain <sighs> yeah <laughs> watch it, it it'll, it'll just hit you right here so and i promise i will tie this in do not start rolling your eyes at me or go ahead and roll your eyes in and close the screen at this next line but i promise i will tie this in in strength training, there is this concept of progressive overload, more of a principle than a concept because it's not some abstract ideal, like it's something you have to actually do. The idea is, again, simple but not easy, as so many principles of value often are. And basically, just, I am not a personal trainer, I'm not an expert, but progressive overload is when you're, when you're routinely lifting weight, you routinely add heavier weight, whether that's every session, every week, every other day, like whatever your intervals are, you routinely add heavier weight to what you're doing. You don't just stop and stay the same weight for extended periods of time, unless you have some kind of um, health issue or you have some kind of injury, whatever your health uh, restrictions might be. But ideally, when you are, when nothing else is prohibiting you health-wise, um, with progressive overload, you add weight because and the body needs to be provided enough stimulus to adapt to change. If you are not providing it anything that's all that different from what it's used to, it's not going to grow. So for everyone out there who wants to build a bigger booty, you cannot just squat the same, you know, 20 pounds every week and expect something to happen. Which, again, I ain't telling you what to do. It's just if you want it to work, that is the idea. So, you know, um... Most people obviously are not going to do this forever. I'm definitely not. Like, I'm not just going to lift and lift and lift until I hit 5,000. That's insane. Um, and not super realistic. Obviously, there's a wall at some point. Um, and I also don't really want to be a professional bodybuilder. Um, maybe if there were less drugs involved in that whole game. Uh, but I bring this up because in magic, growth in magic and growth in druidry, it requires the same principle application. And like in fitness, in magic, everyone has different goals. And that's just reality. Like, it's not like, oh, one person is better or worse than another or more. De like, that doesn't, I don't care. It takes all kinds to make the world. I've said that before. I will say it again um, because it's just a reality of it. So when I say that everyone has different goals and they're doing different things, it is not to mock or put anyone down for having a different calling, for doing something differently than me. It is simply true because we are all different. So some people's goals with fitness are like running a mile in under 10 minutes. Some people want to lose weight. Some people like me want to gain weight I've always been a bit underweight. I've always struggled with eating a, a bit. Um, not here to get into that. But yeah, my, my goal was really just being stronger, being more capable, adding weight, you know, just being able to handle more, being more capable. So, so you know, I go on a little bit to say some are making money on keeping a certain kind of physique so they can sell courses or sell their services in some other way. And a bunch of people just want to live a generally happy, generally healthy life um and they might go to someone else's class sometimes and not make a huge practice of going to the gym all the time themselves it takes all kinds um everyone is going to do what they're going to do so again i bring this up because it is true in magic and paganism as well some people are called to do magic at home to honor the gods or their whatever the kind of, of their kind of magic is privately and in their own lives and they don't really feel the need to step out too much outside of that. And that's cool. Um, some people want to be professional witches. Some people want to sell classes and readings and have storefronts and whatever else. And we need them too. That's great. Uh, some people are called to be clergy. Some people want to be actual pagan priests. Uh, whether that's, you know, officiating weddings in that kind of typical way that we all think. Or if it's literally living the life of, I'm a priest of the Morrigan. You know, I'm dedicating my life to, you know, either a particular God or a particular path. Um, 
And, you know, some people just want to go to public rituals and they just want to go to group working sometimes and they're not really going to do too much on their own. And that doesn't make anyone fucking fake. That's just, again, it's reality. And you're kind of a fool if you uh, try and push people to be something that they're not because people are going to do what they're going to do. So anyways, there is no value judgment to any of that. But... I personally am called to be my own version of corgi. And for those of us who are called to be pagan corgi in whatever way, there is a path set for us. That path involves another version of progressive overload. Maybe not with physical weights. For me, uh, I do all the above. Um, But it's a continuous journey of giving ourselves enough stimulus, enough new information combined with application of that new information, of that enough productive challenges to actually grow and to be more capable than we were the day before. So, you know, you can put this together for yourself, but the concept really does apply in magic because so let's say you sit around doing the same meditation every day you know, that's great. Not shitting on it. Um, uh, Maybe it's quite possible you'll learn something new or you'll come to some new place, but you're not going to learn how to astral project. You're not going to learn herbalism. You're not going to learn how to do a banging ritual with someone other than yourself because you might be great at solitary ritual and you might not be aware of, there really is an element of theatricality to, um, the weeds are digging into me. Don't judge. Um, there is an element of theatricality to doing compelling public rituals and these are all different skills and you are not going to learn that by doing the same thing and not not ever expanding outside of that every single time so again your goals are your own do what the hell you feel called to do that i'm coming from my own place so are you so anyways um i did feel the need to add this one last little note in my essay before starting and i get it i'm already 10 minutes in but This is a YouTube video. Supposedly people like long conversations. Um, But I felt the need to add, and I still do, that because people today seem to love drawing (laughs) to these extreme binary conclusions, I want to state again because I started with a quote that magic doesn't come from talent, magic comes from pain. I'm not saying that magic needs to come from this like heavy, dark, emo, you know, like actual emotional pain all the time. That is not the point of that quote. But very often, what does push us to pursue that next level of, of excellence, what makes us driven to become adepts from you know novices and beginners, that can come from this like innate discontent with life as it is. It can come from, I'm so lonely in a crowded room. It can come from this painful awareness of there is so much more that I can barely put my finger on and I need to bring it into reality in my life just to start with. And obviously, yeah, like real emotional pain can be a portal to that too. Uh, Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes talks about this, that there are different portals to what she calls uh, the wildish nature, which is related and not exactly the same thing. Um, But I believe the quote is something like, if you have a deep wound, if you have a scar, that can be a portal. If you have, you know, a very rich, a very compelling story that means a lot to you, that can be a portal. There are many different portals. So... I wanted to say that mostly because I'm not out here like, we must all be suffering. Like, that's not, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, where was I? But here's, here's the really, here's the part that's really important to me to say in terms of pain and in terms of magic coming from pain and that progressive overload idea and everything. Growth does not come from comfort and magic does not come from stagnation or stillness. There's a lot that's been said and written and practiced about the idea of magic being active and not stagnant. And the idea of stagnation and magic are literally antithetical to each other, at least in the way I do it. Um, So you can have you you can have a great way with words naturally. Maybe maybe you're a gifted poet or writer. Maybe you are naturally talented in the arts of divination or trance. Some people are just seers. Some people just have that. Um, but the fact is there are walls to natural talent and you can be damn good at whatever it is you are naturally, you know, gifted at, but real growth on this path, it takes work. It takes real perseverance, which is one of the nine virtues that I will eventually get into even on the days that it isn't happy and it isn't fun and it isn't easy and it doesn't feel like our spells are working. And that means embracing the pain 
of growth. So magic doesn't come from talent. Magic comes from pain. And with no further ado, here's my understanding of the nine virtues. So for one, wisdom. Wisdom is not only the retention of knowledge or just being able to parrot information. Wisdom is the ability to discern and differentiate, to know what's important. It's to discern the truth from, forgive me for cussing, bullshit. It's to differentiate between a predator who needs to be dealt with and maybe a decent person who might be lashing out from being in pain, who might be in a really bad spot emotionally. And wisdom, being wise, that means knowing how to deal with that predator to the either shun them or get them the hell out of away from your people uh however you do that and going over and giving a hug or just witnessing and listening to that person who's in pain and it, they might be coming off as the polar opposite the predator might be you know wearing sheep's clothing he might be trying to not to generalize, just that person might be trying to come off as I'm just a hurt person, but under it, they are a predator. And on the other side, someone might look real tough, real mean, just rough around the edges and really just be a good person who's in pain. And an example of wisdom is knowing the difference and treating those people accordingly. So that is wisdom. Another quote from Women Who Run With The Wolves, because obviously I love this author. I've said it a million times for years. Uh, she gives us a ton of brilliant quotes from in Women Who Run With The Wolves. But this one in particular comes to mind regarding wisdom. She says, to be strong does not mean to sprout muscles and flex. Although I'm still going to flex on you. It means meeting one's own numinosity without fleeing. It means actively living with the wild nature in one's own way. It means being able to learn being able to stand what we know. So here she's, you know, obviously describing inner strength, which is not for peacocking or attention seeking or clout chasing. It is the ability to integrate our own natures, our own numinosity, as she says, and to actively live with it, to not just like, you know, sit on your armchair and, you know, like think about it in the abstract, but to actually live it and do it. And, you know, ideally be able to help others with that when called for. So, Wisdom is to understand the way of things and be able to apply it. That's that's what I think. And there is a study packet for those on the Dedekind path, which is called A Virtuous Life. And it is compiled by Michael Dangler, um, who I definitely owe a debt of gratitude, as I do with Ian Corrigan, um, with Bonowitz, with, you know, so many of these amazing people who I've learned from their writings and sometimes from their direct words. Um but Dangler brings up the classic book, which I adore this book, uh, The Little Prince, as an example of wisdom. Uh, he specifically says, the wisdom of children and silliness of adults. Now, it's not a long book, so I'm not going to spoil anything for you. I think you should go read it. It's literally like this long, but it will also have you crying like a fucking baby if you're anything like me. So uh, I will just expand on that really quick because I love that he brought it up. Um, the Little Prince is this character. Uh, I see him as a spirit that's in the form of a child, but he has a very, very deep and clear idea of what matters, of what's important. And it isn't how much money do you make? Like, what's your, what do you do? Like, it's, it's not like the normal small talk bullshit, obviously, as most of us might feel. Um, what we can learn from that is to kind of clean our own lens, as it were, uh, and to be able to clearly know what is important, to distinguish it from what isn't, what's just window dressing, what is just the weather of life, and not foundational, but just weather. So whatever we think to be wisdom, I'm going to end on this note, we must be able to apply that to ourselves first to be truly wise and not just preach it at everyone else. Next up, we have piety. And that's another one that, like, like fertility, people don't love that word because it's like, oh, what are you, some, like, holier-than-thou asshole? Um, but I'm just going to get into it. Piety is action, not lip service. It's how you live, which is all the more relevant in an age of posting your rituals and altars on social media for all the world to see. And don't start coming for me. I get that there's perfectly good reason sometimes. I've done stuff like that occasionally. I get it. We're all trying to connect. God damn, there's <laughs> me and the snake. Um, <laughs> I get it. There are reasons why people might sit in a field, even though there's probably a snake somewhere. Anyway, 
you get what I'm saying. I'm not shitting on people for posting their stuff online, but it does create this incentive of making something pretty and not necessarily have a ton of substance. You know what the fuck I'm saying. So piety is what you do when the camera is off. It is to honorably maintain one's word, one's agreements, relationships, and overall integrity without looking to be pat on the back for it. So a component that I find extremely important with piety is that willingness to remain open. Kind of like I just touched on with the little prince, like Angor brought up. Um, it is to remain open, to remain pure in heart, and to operate in good faith. And that is huge, especially, again, to bring up this, like, social media world that we are so often submerged in. Um, and I do mean that in the sense good faith, bad faith arguments in the sense of logic and debate. Where bad faith arguments are the ones that are being made deceptively. They're being made insincerely. Uh, they're resorting to attacks, to manipulation, to mind games, instead of knowledge and discussion. And so many people can just become overtaken by the challenges and hardships of life into becoming bitter, into becoming malicious or careless, and operating in bad faith on a more full-time basis and not just like in an argument where, you know, you get a little sloppy sometimes. So piety is the challenge and responsibility to stay true. And that is no small feat ever, not in this era, not in any period of time. So piety and airplanes, piety calls us to not only keep that old bargain between mortals and gods and do our duty, which is kind of an ADF specific thing. Maybe I'll talk about that another time. Maybe you'll read about it yourself. Um, but it calls us to check our intentions, to check our hearts, and to do our duties from a good place. And this is not me saying that our responsibility should only be done from like happiness and smiles and rainbows and sunshine. Like, I, that's, that's literally never what I'm saying. Um, doing what needs to be done when we're angry and heartbroken, as we sometimes are, um, that can be worth so, so much more than doing it on the days that it is easy that we are happy to do it. So what I mean by that is that piety, it calls on us not just to do our duty, but to do it meaningfully and sincerely and not from a place of bitterness or resentment or attention seeking. Be fucking angry if you're angry, be heartbroken if you're heartbroken, but don't be sitting there thinking evil thoughts, wishing evil on people coming from this bitter malicious place. That's not it. So moving on, w vision. <laughs> vision to me speaks to deeper sight beyond the mundane surface level affairs of the day-to-day -day world. I've heard this quote, I saw this online, that, uh, you know, fools, fools talk about other people. They gossip, they talk about, you know, social nonsense, who's cheating on who, blah, blah. Um, halfway sort of decently smart people talk about events, you know, history, politics, what's going on in the world, and such like. The wise, in this quote, discuss ideas, and Maybe that's a pretentious quote. I get that life is not always that simple. Sometimes, yeah, you know, you are going to discuss how's, how are our friends doing? Like, what's going on in life? You can't just live under a rock. It's not a freaking, you know, like, 100% take fully as it is. Sorry, guys. I uh, cut myself off not because uh, the snake finally got me or bees, which are obviously evidently both here if you can hear that buzzing. Um, there are just people walking, and I didn't want to be that weirdo. So... Let's get back into it. Um, I'm just saying, obviously, I am going to use the quote for a reason, but take it with a grain of salt. I get it. Talk about what you're going to talk about. Anyway, I agree with the primary idea behind this quote, and I think it lends itself well to the virtue of vision here. Vision, like wisdom, is having the perspective and the mental lens of sorts to see what's actually important, what's beneath all the facades and weather of the world of who did what to who for how many jelly beans, uh, who's mad at who, like whatever. Um, it's not missing the forest for the trees. So the definition that we see in the dedicant path uh, in ADF is vision as the ability to broaden one's perspective, to have a greater understanding of our place and our role in the cosmos relating to the past, present, and future. And that does again speak to the relationship innate to all living beings, to all spirits. We haven't yet gotten into hospitality, but we will. So just hold that thought if you have questions there. And the importance of gauging where we are and what our honor obligations are in relation to that. So vision calls to mind the question that I have sometimes asked myself about why even bother with divination? Why bother developing vision in the psychic sense? And it sure as hell is not the parlor trick that it is sometimes reduced to. It is attuning our mental sight 
dusting off our mental lens to avail ourselves of all knowledge possible so that we may navigate life as deeper and more thoughtful human beings. And also because we're goddamn witches and that's what we do. So these virtues are, are I will say this a few times probably, uh, all interrelated with each other. So while we may have the vision and it's valuable to uh, cultivate that vision to look at painful truths, to look at painful truths about ourselves and others in the world, it is wisdom that steps in to let us know when maybe we're over-focusing on that. Maybe we're over-focusing on stuff that is no longer helpful or productive or doing anything good by us fixating on it. So vision speaks to the fact that we need to be able to do so to begin with. We need to be able to look without averting our gaze. And, or otherwise we will remain prisoners of the external of life merely happening to us rather than us collaborating with the powers that be to bring about our own life, which is actually something that I might use to define why bother with paganism or magic in general. It is to collaborate with the powers that be to bring about your own life. So anyways, on to the next, on to courage. Courage is acting on the knowledge that integrity is more important than comfort. And I will take credit for that because I am quoting some things here, but not everything is a quote. That is actually mine. This next part, though, is a quote. And someone's definitely running next to me. Whatever. Uh, Faithless is he that says farewell when the road darkens, uh, said Gimli in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And I love this quote because it isn't just about, like, being macho or putting on some act. Or he doesn't use the word coward. He uses the word faithless. Um, and that, I think that concept of faith and honor being intertwined is something that us druids are very familiar with and other kinds of pagans are definitely familiar with as well where right action is an el is an expression of faith that in itself is an explicit offering to our gods uh to our ancestors and sometimes maybe to the nature spirits hell if i know i tend to do uh offerings like that for gods and ancestors but anyway um we must cultivate courage even when we don't feel like it in order to do right by our word by our own promise of living honorably which is what we're taking on by you know taking the dedicant path so this part is important to me this next part that courage it may look fearless on the surface but it is not the same as fearlessness and you do not need to be fearless to be brave courage can and often does express itself in the presence of extreme fear extreme doubt extreme anxiety Courage is being terrified and stepping forward anyways. Courage is knowing. <laughs> Ooh, if that was a spirit speaking through me or something. Because uh, what I wrote is courage is acting on the knowledge that integrity is more important than fear or being uncomfortable. Courage, all emotions aside, whatever those emotions may be, is clarity. It is wisdom in action. On to the next. Onward. Integrity. Integrity is the key to everything. Everything we do here, everything in magic, everything in paganism, specifically, and obviously life in general. Integrity is the foundation to everything we are doing and aiming to do here. Integrity is honor. It is cohesion and consistency with ethics and one's own true higher nature. When I look at conventional definitions for integrity, when you, if you Google it, you'll see words like honesty, strong principles, moral brightness. And those are definitely part of the picture. But ultimately, integrity is both that goodness of heart and cohesion of that uh, being expressed in word and deed, in actual action and practicality, not just, oh, I believe in X, Y, and Z, but I talk tail and run when things start to go not my way. When things start to go south, I start to, you know, just run the other direction. So principles are <laughs> Let me go back real quick. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Right, right, right. Okay, it's that cohesion of word and action and executing consistency of that co cohesion every single time. Not just when people are watching and not just when we're in the right or when it's easy to do so, but every single time. Principles are nothing without action. Again, this virtue shows us that the biggest expression of faith is in acting, in doing, not just thinking and talking. It is having the courage of our convictions. It is letting our actions be the proof of our principles. And don't kill me, uh, any traditional witches out there, but I have heard it said in traditional witchcraft teachings that integrity is you know, the currency. It is the coin we pay to do magic. Otherwise, it all falls apart. And you can, of course, do magic just like you can go through life without integrity. Many people do. I'm sure some of us have met those people. But 
That magic is, and we will go into some of these ideas later, that magic is no longer an expression of anything good. It is no longer an expression of the life force. And, you know, just to say it simply, this druidry is, in my understanding, ADF druidry is about, you know, being life affirming. It's not about being destructive like that. Obviously, there's balance. Obviously, you need chaos to bring about change, yada, yada. But you know what I'm saying. So living like that, doing magic like that is not an affirmation of vitality, creation, fertility, and so much more that we value. And yes, we will talk about fertility. Magic in a life without integrity is an affirmation of destruction, decay, and will inevitably bring those qualities about in that practitioner's real life, should you choose to go through life that way, which of course you can. So obviously you can have integrity and fuck things up. You can, you know, your heart or intentions or whatever, this is why intention is not everything, mind you. Um, you can have integrity in there and still fuck up because these are not the same qualities. Integrity does not mean perfection. And other virtues here speak more to the other qualities that will help you in not fucking up quite as much. Like uh, integrity is not wisdom, for example. Like very naive people very often will have great integrity and they'll have these hearts of gold, but they will sadly lack the wisdom to protect themselves from those that would take advantage of them, of their heart, of them meaning well. So integrity uh, is also interrelated with piety though, not just wisdom. It's related to all of them, I guess. Um, because I think for those of us that no longer, maybe once did, and no longer suffer from excess naivete, the challenge is not being too gullible and it's more so not becoming too cynical. Personal thing for myself, maybe some of you can relate. Um, so like piety, and by cultivating that as well, integrity invites us to reject cynicism in favor of representing that which we may be suffering a lack of, that which we may be craving in others, which is representing honor in a world that no longer values that. So that is integrity. You Again, you can fuck up, but integrity is uh, having the drive to go back and make it right to the best of your ability or to act honorably and do what uh, you know you're supposed to do. So next up we have perseverance and get ready. There's definitely going to be some holistic meathead type shit here. Perseverance. I think perseverance could be swapped out with discipline here, but both apply to the same effect. I used to overly fixate on reading pagan concepts from only pagans like pagan practitioners and authors alone. But as the years have passed that I've been trying to do the dedicant uh, path and my interests have rounded out a bit more and I'm not quite as hyper-focused on only a few things, I've learned that even the nine virtues are not pagan concepts in and of themselves. And those who don't explicitly identify as pagan have plenty to offer. They ha and they might have more personal knowledge than someone sitting around writing about courage who's never, you know, like lifted their pinky to help anyone. Um, but with perseverance, I specifically think of Jocko Willink, who, if you were not familiar, is a retired Navy SEAL who teaches about discipline in, I think, a pretty wholesome fucking way, but also a very practical way. And not everyone likes that. So specifically, Jocko values discipline over motivation. And why that is, is because feeling motivated is fickle and unreliable. I think we all know that. If we only did things when we felt motivated, when we felt like it, they would never get finished. They would never get to the level that they could get to if we just showed the fuck up and did it when we didn't want to. Um, so we cannot rely on that alone. Though it is nice when it comes and it should be harnessed to the fullest of its abilities. I love it when I feel motivated because, yeah, sure, like I, I will be, I'll have that pop in my step and I'll be happier to get stuff done. I won't be dragging ass quite as much. Um, but perseverance is that willingness and capacity to persevere through that utter lack of motivation, through the presence of any number of difficult and downright crappy emotions or events, through anger, through anxiety, through bitterness, through heartbreak, through any number of personal circumstances. It's, again, achieving our goals, fulfilling our responsibilities, and keeping our word that's far more important than temporary discomfort or even, you know, like you're fucking tired or you're in pain or whatever it is. Um, your eventual goals, you're keeping your word. 
at least in this perspective, to me is more important than that. Do not jump on my fucking throat as if I'm telling people what to do. You're choosing to watch this. Some of y'all forget that on the internet sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> so sometimes, where am I? Perseverance is that inner drive of duty that knows our actions and efforts add up and make a difference even when we cannot yet see them. That's important to note because sometimes we are the last ones to be able to know when we are doing better in life, when we're doing better than we were yesterday, when we're more capable, when we're stronger, whatever you know realm of strength uh, is important to us right now, whether that's emotional or physical or both. So perseverance to build our goals, no matter the external circumstances, is a way to hold our integrity and honor throughout our lives. So I find the idea of perseverance and discipline over motivation to, in this like endless rabble about mindset, to be reassuring. I don't find that to be harsh or tough love or whatever the fuck it is, because it is more practical. Um, it isn't this new age modality that like nothing else matters except for how you feel. And I've talked about this before if you've listened to my podcast, which may be well intentioned for some people, but <clears throat> it keeps us trapped in this crib sort of mind state. It keeps us trapped in this crib like cage of our own making. Because when you tell people to just lay down and take a nap and do nothing every time they're tired or upset as if we're infants, you are condemning them. You are cursing them to a horrible fucking life, far worse than someone encouraging you to show up and put in that work towards your fucking dreams, you know, when you don't feel like it, because <clears throat> it adds up to something greater. And personally, you know, like I would rather live a life that I don't feel the need to take a nap or a vacation or some or something to escape from it. I'd rather live a life where I'm not engaging in escapism to deal with it. I want the life that I am building. So that means showing the fuck up because where was I? I was going a little bit of rant there. Um, you know, like I've wrestled with clinical depression and some other clinical issues in my life. Uh, that's for real. Like, that's not like I diagnosed myself on the internet. And if I just stayed in bed every time that I was depressed, rent would not get paid. Bills would not get paid. I would be on the street. I would have nothing to show for myself. I would accomplish nothing. And again, I would be living a horrible fucking life. So I've said this before and I'll say it again, telling people to just, you know, obviously rest is fucking important. It's crucial actually muscles grow to bring it back to that me head stuff. Muscles grow in rest, muscles grow in sleep. So you actually I am not out here saying just push through everything and never stop. That's fucking stupid. And that's also the point of the wheel of the year is that you have those periods of generativity and creation and life and vitality. And then it's followed by that, you know, um, crawling back into the earth for rest, for sleep, for regeneration. I'm definitely on a tangent again, but you know, don't, don't try and push me in some binary box here. That's not what I'm saying. So anyways, um, our emotional inner worlds are, of course, important and crucial as human beings, but to prioritize them to that extreme is a luxury none of us can or should actually afford, and it would set us into a deep imbalance even if we were rich enough to not actually worry about paying rent or bills every time we wanted to just lay around doing nothing. Because I'm not that rich. I don't know about you, but e that's kind of what I'm going out of my way to say. Even if some of us are, bless ya, um to just sit around having nothing going for you, that is, you're gonna find yourself in a deep imbalance. So yes, perseverance is absolutely a virtue and that is what it means to me. Moving on, this one I'm reluctant to even like get into and I will have to do its own piece at some point. I just kind of wanna finish my fucking dedicant path after five years, so I'm just like getting it done and I'll elaborate later. Um, so hospitality. If you are pagan, if you're a druid, especially, you understand why. I'm hesitant to even just get into it because it's huge, but it's what I got to do. So hospitality is one of those integral principles to druidry and this kind of magic that may sound small or obvious to the point of foolishness to someone who doesn't understand it. Hospitality as a virtue speaks to the relationship and exchange inherent to all beings, all life. We are in relationship with all life, all that is, all of the time. And hospitality is the principle of honoring those relationships and honoring that exchange. So please be careful to note, I am not saying that every relationship is based on uh, friendship or romance, as people tend to assume when they hear the word relationship. 
we have relationships with our neighbors, for example. We have relationships with our landlords. We have relationships with our professors. We may hate these people. We may love them. We may not interact with them all that much. They might be okay in doses. You see what I'm saying here? But we are all alive. We are all on this earth. And we live in relation to each other in whatever way, whatever capacity, from small and uninvolved to larger, deeper, and more actively engaged. And this same principle extends to gods, to ancestors, to nature spirits, and to other human beings. Within all of those relationships, within that wide, various web, for one, the grass grows where you water it, for two, there is always right and honorable action um, on any side, whether you're the guest or the host. And I will get into that a little bit. Uh, and, you know, where there is right and honorable action, there is not right and not honorable action. Um, so as druids, my belief is that we seek to keep our part in those relationships as honorable as possible. So when I when I came out here, just as an example, and I try to do this whenever possible, um, when I came out and I was looking for a place to record this when I was done writing, um, I had a few shots in a, in a bottle, not for me, don't get on my ass, um, of whiskey, of yushka, waters of life, uh, because that is what I like to give to the spirit. So when I found the place that I wanted to sit down um, and record this, uh, I gave a little just, you know, pray, uh, not really prayer, just an evocation of acknowledgement, of offering, of uh, I am a guest in your home. Uh, I, you know, I simply ask respectfully that I, as a druid, be allowed to, you know, do my thing, make this video safely <laughs> without getting attacked. Um, my name of the wildlife, that you do your thing, I'll do mine. My hat is off to you. This is your home and I defer to you first. So that's kind of, uh, you know, when I'm doing anything anywhere for longer than a couple minutes or just passing through, um, that's something that's important to me to do. Um, so to go back to that, uh, to my actual writing here, uh, to again make myself clear, this does not necessarily mean uh, being nice or surrendering yourself to people that hate you or to people that are actively uh, you know, just work to work destructively against you to whatever capacity. I don't, I don't need to make up imaginary scenarios. You guys are adults. Uh, hopefully, you know, you get it. So when I say honor and that we have honor obligations, I do not mean being fucking nice. So <sighs> my first mentor, who was a pagan witch of a few different paths, including uh, Celtic paganism, he used to say that Celtic hospitality was that when a stranger showed up to your property for three days, you were obligated to take care of them, to feed them, to water them, etc. You had obligations as a host. After those three days, presumably if they had wronged you or offended you or violated their side as guests somehow, uh, you could take them to the edge of your property and kill them. So don't ask me 100% what he meant by that. Um, we had a uh sometimes tempestuous uh complicated relationship that i still learned a lot from and he has since passed on into the next realm so i can't ask him exactly what he meant but obviously it's a dramatic example and it's stuck in my mind because of that so <laughs> it's always been a pointed illustration in the fact that hospitality sure as fuck does not simply mean being nice so obviously do right by people until they give you a reason not to, and then reevaluate. That is kind of my thought on that. Um, hospitality is basically another way, though, of saying, of discussing the dance of fates, of our obligations in this life, being based on our nature as human beings and our fates as the, you know, the individuals with our own strings of fate that we are. Because without fate and honor, the obligations <laughs> that we hold in this life, we would not be able to uphold our end of any bargains that we make, which makes the kind of magic that we modern druids do pretty impossible. Because the magic that modern druids do is, you know, contingent on this old bargain between mortals and gods, which you can learn more about on ADF. Uh, I think it's .org if you would like. If you want to look up Arnraf Finn, you can do that. It's a different video that's long enough. So, ADF druidry heavily values this virtue as shown both in its inclusion, hello birds, in the nine virtues, and also in this value of ghosty which is a Proto-Indo-European word, root word, that serves as both root for guest and host. Speaking to reciprocal duties of hospitality, as stated in the American Heritage College Dictionary. Ghosty is a really fascinating concept. Um, and as I said in the beginning, hospitality 
is huge. This is really something that I don't like to summarize, but I have to. I will get into more deeply later because it'll bother me if I don't. Um, <laughs> but this is basically my summary for now. Hospitality is the magic of life of the exchange inherent to all life. And I would even say that um, whereas forgiveness is sort of the crucial virtue of Christianity, hospitality is the crucial virtue of Druidry, of this kind of paganism. So moving right on. Moderation. ADF's definition of moderation is cultivating one's appetites so that one is neither a slave to neither a slave to them nor driven to ill health, mental or physical, through excess or deficiency. I love this and I love that it it indicates both sides through excess or deficiency, through abs, abstinence or addiction. Um and I personally feel moderation is what makes us effective, not effected. Yes, I know many puns and such today. Um, not a pun, whatever. Uh, moderation is, again, what separates dedicated practitioners from people that simply go with the flow, taking whatever whatever comes as it comes and not really navigating it, not learning from it, just kind of being overwhelmed by it every single time. So moderation is not about repressive asceticism. It is to reject both abstinence and addiction in favor of of the middle path, someone I love very much, who I also have a tempestuous relationship with, because I'm a fucking Scorpio, um, says that addicts and ascetics are two sides of the same coin. And, um, you know, I've loved that. That's that's another thing that's stuck with me for a while. Seanisms, as it were. Um, so anyway, uh, it is to reject both abstinence and addiction in favor of the middle path. Uh, and to choose the middle path of moderation here means to acknowledge and embrace the fact that we are physical beings, that live in a physical world and engaging with that in such a way that protects and values our actual well-being and sense of harmony. Uh, Philip and Stephanie Cargom, who are, I don't know their exact role in the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. I know they're very important to it. Sorry, guys, no disrespect intended. Only respect intended, actually, because I'm quoting them here. Um, they said this of the Feralt card in the Druid craft tarot, which I actually have in my bag, but I'm not going to go digging through it right now. Um... And I believe that it applies here. We have developed a fluency of movement between worlds. We no longer feel uncomfortable in the physical world or yearn for the inner world, but allow our awareness to flow naturally between inner and outer, between using our everyday common sense and using our intuition or inner senses. Um, for those of you who are uh, tarot readers, uh, the Feralt card is their version of the Temperance card, which relates to alchemy, turning lead into gold, turning shit into <laughs> something worth living for, to worth living with. Um, you get the idea. But I loved that description uh, for Feralt, for Temperance, and for, and they are druids, so I think that they're, you know, talking about a similar, if not the same kind of idea. Moderation is what makes that fluency of movement, that motion, the ability to explore both paths possible to begin with, so you don't get lost in the weeds, you know, stuck doing the extreme of either side. So, without moderation, those lines of delineation do not even exist. Mircea Eliad, who, uh, his writings, I don't know about him as a person, but, uh, a lot of his work I have a lot of love for and has been at least very valuable for me on my journey. Um, so Mircea Eliade wrote extensively on the concept of what he calls the sacred and the profane. Um, I tend to use the word mundane because I am not trying to get into a five-hour conversation on how he's just talking about the physical realm as being profane and that it's, you know, like mundane, it's, it's tangible, it's whatever. There's like moral connotations to that that people take, like it's a very loaded word. Um, so I say mundane because it's more practical. Um, but basically, <laughs> sacred space where ritual happens, where magic happens, where catharsis and, you know, all those wonderful magical things happen, that is made possible by the fact that it's contained, that there are boundaries, that uh, it has surrounding lines, that there are beginnings and ends, and that allows us to understand the distinction, to, you know, hedge ride, to hop between those two things, uh, for my witches out there, um, because getting stuck on that side it's not a good fucking idea. <laughs> um, it's said of the Celtic other world that um, mortals who go there, they emerge either insane or as poets. And that 
is not like just some throwaway comment like poet had a much deeper meaning in that um i think it's important to focus on the insane part like we're not supposed to live there we can visit and that sort of poetry of living in Alwyn, of being a witch of being a druid you have that ability to go in and out but you need to go in and then out there and back again so that is the importance of moderation in my own words and here we have my longest fucking video ever. Um, we have the last virtue here, fertility. And people react like knee-jerk, reflex, uh, you know, bad juju, like reaction against <laughs> the word fertility. I've seen people at rituals where someone brings up fertility uh, just physically like jump and look repulsed because like they don't want kids. And the first thing, I'm not here, I'm not, I'm not in that pregnancy shit. Like... That's not what it is. So, in the Dedican Path coursework, you can read about fertility, their definitions, as, you know, a it's bounty of mind, body, and spirit involving creativity and industry, and appreciation of the physical and sensual, and nurturing these qualities in others. And that's great. That's very true. But I'm going to elaborate, you know, because it's, uh, it's a heavily summarized definition. And I'm trying to show you guys how blue the sky is, but... The sun keeps wanting to poke through as it does. So, anyway, you'll have to go outside for yourselves. Um, as I was saying, fertility is one of the most misunderstood magical concepts for what are obvious reasons. People hear the word fertility and assume that it relates to physical pregnancy of an actual baby, which is just not the case when when we're doing magic. We are innately, like, we're by definition operating from a sense of mythic truth, not literal objective reality. So... So much of sympathetic magic. <laughs> I didn't. Oh, sorry. Guys, I'm reading stuff and I have ADD, so don't judge me. Let's start that over. So much of magic is sympathetic and based on overlap and commonalities across experience. And, you know, like building on, focusing on those experiences and bringing them together to create more of that thing, um, which is maybe uh, the most dummies 101 explanation of sympathetic magic I've ever given or heard. <laughs> but. So yes, uh, sometimes we do use the symbol of actual pregnancy. Some of the goddesses, you know, like are in these like pregnant fertile states and such like. Um, so we might use those symbols. They may be used sometimes uh, for magical purposes, but we are engaging in sacred space, not in profane or mundane as, as I said I put it. So fertility can be much more easily understood as being in the spirit of fruitfulness and growth of moving forward, of growing rather than remaining stagnant. Fertility pertains to the capacity for being life-oriented rather than, you know, again, stagnant and more in alignment with the element of stillness and decay to align with fertilities to be the opposite of that. So where am I? To be fertile in a magical sense is to be alive, to feed one's own fruitfulness and not one's own destructiveness or decay. To align oneself with fertility as a virtue is to align oneself with the current of life. All of this being said, the land goes through phases of fertility and also fallowness of generativity and also of rest. And so much of our nature reverence in the high holy days does come from both honoring those phases in the earth and aiming to align with them ourselves. So as I was saying earlier, I am the last person to be on some grind set nonsense. Like I make jokes because it's funny, but no. Like, you should not be out here, like, just grinding every single second of your life. That's a great, like, no. Just, <laughs> people get heart attacks from that shit. It's not the point. That's no way to live. So, when I first started studying the Wheel of the Year, let's see if I can't put you somewhere else. Here we go. When I first started studying the Wheel of the Year, I thought to myself that it just felt right because i unconsciously i came to this i had this thought in my head that was like okay either i do the wheel or the wheel does me like either i intentionally consciously go through these phases of like growth and generativity creation um and then rest and such like and regeneration if i don't do that consciously in this aligned way it will just do it to me like <laughs> when you burn yourself out uh you find yourself getting sick your immune system is compromised um you can look into Andrew Huber Huberman and stuff. Uh, his podcast, Huberman Lab, is great for explaining the science side of that sort of thing. So, yeah, I just found that 
you know, I'm a human being and I, in my mind, human beings sort of align with that cycle naturally. So it made sense for me and still makes sense for me to do that consciously. So where was I? Life moves in that certain way of vitality and creation followed by rest and regeneration, repeating itself after uh, turn after turn of the wheel. So fertility, I think, is also just remaining open to and aligned with that deeper life cycle of the earth itself, for we are already t connected and tend to suffer when we forget that. And wow, yeah, after about a goddamn hour in these beautiful hollow hills <laughs> full of all manner of wildlife and oak trees that I am under and, you know, happy to be surrounded by, I think this video is done. Um, for those of you who watched the whole thing, thank you. Um, I had been wanting to, as I said, put out actual stuff on real Druidry and not just talking about it, but sharing what it is comprised of. So again, this is not a historical, this is not a documentary. This is just part of my own work as a dedicant on the dedicant path in a specific, you know, coursework curriculum within Arnriacht vein. And it's been a big part of my own practice. I do hold by these tenets. I do actually believe in it. Um, but I am obviously not speaking for every single human being who happens to identify with druidic magic and such like everywhere in the world in every period of time. So uh, <laughs> let's just actually not, ex yeah, I, I would, I would love it if I lived in a world where I didn't have to say that when I made videos, um, where I could just say I am queerly just speaking for myself and my own experience, but it's not the world we live in. So I hope that was of use to you. I hope that um, is something for you to think about at the very least. If you want to learn more, um, I'm not being paid or sponsored, nor was I asked to do any of this. I just, you know, I love it. So I wanted to share it. Um, you can go to uh, Arnriot Fane's website. It was ADF.org. I think they're like trying to make a new website that doesn't look like it's from 2002. <laughs> um, more power to them. Uh, but yeah, you, you can find more about that on their website. The Dedicant Path is optional, not demanded or required um, for all members. And if you want to be a member, um, you can pay 30 bucks a year or go find a local grove. And um, I think at least with the grove that I came up in, you can uh, exchange just volunteering time uh, and someone will help you out with that. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to go enjoy this fine and beautiful day. I would recommend that you do the same. So while this is not an actual episode of a culture wars, I'm going to end it the same way. Thank you very kindly for listening, but now is the time to close your screen, shut down your laptop, put down your phone, go outside and go do some magic. Our priestess out.